Good afternoon from Chicago. Welcome to Wine Cellars Wine Weekend. My name is Lee Slussinger, and I am the Vice President here at Wine Cellars of Portfolio Management and Education, which puts me in a great position to do these virtual tastings. I'm really excited about today's virtual tasting. We have a living rock star winemaking legend, Francois Lerton, and uh, he was born into the wine industry. His family tree is full of iconic producers. Um, from his home in Bordeaux, we will be talking to him, I believe, or maybe he's uh, just outside, it. but he's in France, and we'll be joining him in France. I wanna give him a little bit of background. He doesn't need too much uh, introduction, but he was one of the first flying winemakers, meaning he would work Northern Hemisphere uh, vintages and Southern Hemisphere vintages, opposite sides of the year, and has worked all over the globe, really interesting places. Um, one of the places he fell in love with is what we'll talk about today, which is Chile, and his project in Chile called Hacienda Aracano. Um, we're also going to be joined by Diego, his right-hand man down there, and he's Diego will talk to us a little bit about biodynamics. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Francois Lerton, with whom we've been working with for about 20 years, but he'll tell us a little bit more about himself and his background. So Francois, welcome to the show. Hello. Well, thank you uh, to, uh, to receive me, uh, if I can say, <laughs> traveling, uh, traveling the Atlantic uh, by, uh, by video. So let's uh, people from the uh, United States and spend many from Chicago to, uh, to hear a little bit of uh, French accent. The, um, so myself, I, I, am close, I am in my, uh, my house close to Bordeaux uh, on the seaside. And uh, from there, I still manage my, uh, my companies uh, that I have uh, around the world because I produce wine in Argentina, Chile, uh, Spain, and, um, and in different places of France. And I'm part of different uh, wineries uh, at Bordeaux also that I share with the family. So it's a large, uh, because I'm born at Bordeaux in uh, an old family of uh, wine producers. I've created a, a consultancy business in the early uh, 90s that I have started to travel everywhere in the world as a flying winemaker or as a wine consultant. And, uh, and I've started in the middle of the 90s to create my own uh, wineries in Argentina, Chile, Spain, Uruguay, in, and uh, Portugal, uh, Australia. And slowly by slowly, things have changed. And today, we are going to speak of uh, Chile, Chile, which is my, one of my oldest uh, uh, places uh, created uh, in 1999, and, uh, which is a, a nice, um, small uh, winery uh, in the, that I created, uh, like different others, uh, from scratch in the, in the Valle de Lolol. Valle de Lolol is the, at the, on the seaside of the, the, the Colchagua Valley. And it is quite a cool area, just at the limit at the, between the hot and uh, the cold, uh, cold area. And uh, this uh, Lolol uh, area is very interesting. We, we cultivated uh, organic and uh, biodynamic uh, since uh, 10 years now. And, uh, and Diego, which is uh, uh, going to speak with after me, is going to explain you a little bit more about biodynamics. Uh, let's, show them some, let's show them a map. We, we like seeing where we are, and let's let's see a map and some images of uh, where you are in Lalol. So I'm going to pull in a little PowerPoint here, and we'll take a look at. Hold on. So we are the the, the if you have the the the, the one we shows the influence between the the mountain and um, go go ahead a little bit on the pictures. Let's go a little, uh, little bit. Voilà, in the Colchagua Valley, you can see the Colchagua. Oui, go ahead, next one. But, uh, and, and there, you can see the old Colchagua Valley. So the Colchagua Valley is, uh, us, we are on the, uh, close to the sea, uh, to the sea. And, uh, uh, but the Colchagua starts from the mountain. So it's all the green and the gray on the, on the right uh, side, uh, the Colchagua Valley. And it's a large region, which is, uh, Colchagua has been, the, the, um, the, the valley of the year in the wine enthusiast a few years ago. And since then, it is today the, the region, uh, the best known with uh, Casablanca of Chile. 
et producing uh, some of uh, the famous wines, especially in the Valley de Apalta, where I have also another vineyard myself, uh, a small vineyard of four hectares. So I have these two situations. And also I have another small winery where I, I, uh, I use uh, grapes that I buy around, which is uh, on the north of the Valle de Colchagua, which is also on the map. Uh, and, um, this is the, the three places where, where we are. The, if, voilà, this is interesting to explain. Uh, Chile is a long uh, country, uh, north-south, and uh, the, on the, there is the two mountains, the mountains uh, which are the Andes, which are very high and which are uh, like a wall. You, the, 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 the climate cannot go from there to Argentina. And as another small uh, coastal range, which going to 2,000, 2,500, which is uh, on, the, on the coast. And this coastal range is where we are. We are in the middle of it, and it is a very cool area because we get this cold uh, uh, entrance of air coming from the, the sea, which is very cold due to the the um, the, the, stream, the stream the stream of uh, Humboldt, hmm? and, uh, which coming from the the the, the, um, the South Pole. And this, uh, this region is very interesting. The, the climate is, uh, there is a big differences between night and days. And, uh, and uh, due to this uh, difference of temperature between night and days, we have a very good acidity in, uh, in our uh, juice. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, also this, uh, um, this allowed us to, to grow some type of grapes like Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, which are very sensitive to the, to the humidity and the freshness of the morning. Let's you take a look at some of the images here from the estate. Hold on, you can see. So it's a uh, we I uh, I bought uh, the foothills of a uh, small mountain, and uh, the, it's a uh, it's a piece of land of two hundred hectares, so something like a three six hundred acres, and uh, and uh, we I have planted uh, something like. Uh, uh, hundred acres, a little bit less than hundred of these acres. In and uh, the I have several varieties, uh, a lot of Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, but also Carmener, essentially Carmener. But there I have also in the vineyard of uh, of Apalta. This is uh, you can see it's a foothills of the uh, of a small uh, uh, mountain. And uh, the the we have a very nice exposition, which is. Exposition North, and uh, the an exposition North is like a southern ex exposition when you are in the um, in the northern northern hemisphere. So it's quite uh, hot, uh, uh, hot, um, hot place. But at the uh, with this uh, uh, flow of um, clouds coming in the morning, we have uh, uh, almost uh, I can say three or four hours of the day. Uh, voilà, you can see it there on the picture, the, the flow in the morning. That cover us uh, until uh, 11 uh, almost uh, every morning. We have 300 days of fog uh, every year. And uh, that uh, makes our climate very particular. This is during the autumn, during the harvest. At the harvest, we have to uh, protect the vineyards uh, with nets against the birds because we have a lot of birds where we are eating, uh, eating uh, the grapes. So we have uh, to protect them. So it is a very wild area because we are alone. We have no neighbors. So that's allowed us to, to be very organic, to, not, to have no influence of uh, any chemicals from neighbors. And uh, that makes a, a very nice area, very attractive. And also, as you can see, the view from the, 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 the winery and from my house uh, is uh, fabulous. So you can, uh, um, you, you, we, we receive a lot of uh, tourism, a lot of people who come to, uh, to see us in this house. We have a, it's like a small hotel also. You can, uh, you can come and sleep if you want. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a very nice place to visit when you'll be allowed uh, again to, to travel because for the moment uh, <laughs> it's quite difficult. Yeah, well, we talk a little bit about the, um, the fog and visiting. So let's visit virtually by tasting our um, Humo Blanco. And bear with me one second. So we have three wines that we're going to taste today. And the first of which is the Humo Blanco. 
Now, humo blanco is uh, what we call humo blanco means uh, uh, white smoke in uh, in English, huh? and uh, and uh, this humo blanco uh, it's uh, it's a range uh, organic or biodynamic. So it's uh, it's certified by uh, Demeter. Demeter is a biodynamic uh, certificator. And uh, this wine uh, made of Sauvignon Blanc is a very uh, special Sauvignon Blanc, I must say, because myself, I work, uh, uh, I like to work like in Bordeaux and in some places of France, uh, uh, fermenting a part of the, 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 the white in the, in the barrels and the rest in uh, eggs, small eggs, small vats, which are of the size of eggs. Mm -hmm. Doing so, I obtain a white wine, which are very fat in mouth, very round, very on the, the, the white, white fruit side. I'd, I'm not like uh, the many of the, 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 the Pacific people, uh, like in New Zealand or on the coast of Chile, who makes a very minty, green expression. Um, uh, uh, myself, I am much more on the white fruit expression. And uh, I try to, to work uh, more, much more on the body of the wine, to make a wine very round down uh, it can look as a chardonnay in mouth uh, for uh, the my sauvignon for that is quite special and different than the others uh, i like to, to to harvest ripe the, the sauvignon which that i don't do uh, everywhere i don't do that in france in france i, I harvest much earlier with less alcohol and i make a sauvignon uh, much uh, sharper i must say more crispy but uh, i think in chile if uh, if you get if you harvest too early, you get this green expression, this uh, uh, eucalyptus expression. That uh, the, after that you get a Sauvignon which is very similar to the others. You don't have this terroir expression. So myself, I, I wanted to be uh, more on the, the the true terroir expression than uh, on uh, than doing a Sauvignon like the others. Yeah, I'd love to see some feedback from people. So feel free to ask some questions on the chat, and we'll try to get to them. For me, I find the wine. A very, as you said, a riper style and more stone fruit and less herbaceous with great body and texture to the to the wine too. Very different than, for instance, a New Zealand style or even Sancerre, just more voluminous and riper. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't think we have the minerality of, uh, not minerality, but this uh, acidity uh, uh, of Sancerre. But we have, uh, we, uh, we, uh, it's quite, the wine is still a, a, pure, a pure Sauvignon Blanc. Eh? It has the expression of the Sauvignon Blanc. Eh? And it is a crispy, fresh, with a, a little bit acidic. And, uh, and it is very refreshing. So the, the, um, it's a perfect companion to uh, to fish and uh, and to, uh, as an aperitif. Uh, this uh, this Sauvignon uh, it is uh, another Sauvignon, another style of Sauvignon. Looks a little bit uh, like uh, some Californian uh, Sauvignon, more more similar to a California Sauvignon, I must say, than to New Zealand uh, to New Zealand or French. Yeah, we have a question here from Lucy from, I believe she's in Austin, a friend that's been watching quite a bit of our virtual tasting. She wants to know, we touched on the fermentation vessels. You said you use stainless steel and concrete eggs. So uh, the concrete eggs are, uh, the, the eggs are concrete. And uh, the, 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 um, we, we do some fermentation in barrels, which are big barrels of 400 liters. And also we do some, uh, some in uh, stainless steel uh, vats. But uh, it's only, um, let's say, 40% of the volumes. Very, very interesting. Different fermentation vessels looking for different characteristics in the wine. Uh -huh. And we, we, blend, uh, we blend them after that because they, they have, uh, in function of the parcels, the majority of the grapes, the selection and the, the quality uh, of the, 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 the vintage, we, uh, we decide to, to use more or less the, the, the one, or the, one continent or the other. And uh, and it makes uh, uh, the always something interesting to blend and uh, to find the perfect blend of, of them. And here's another quick question from Charlie Master joining us from Maine. Are your vines clones from France? And if so, where? <laughs> no, uh, the, the the clones the clones are coming from France, effectively. Uh, but uh, uh, the, these clones. Have to in Chile there is a quarantine, a ca quarantine like we are in at the moment, but uh, for uh, two or three years uh, before to be replanted because uh, you can Chile is a very protected uh, country, and so it has been imported by a specialist of the region uh, which has imported a, a clone from France, but uh, 
sincerely, uh, I don't know where, where it, uh, where it comes from, but uh, uh, certainly the clones that I have are clones from the Loire Valley, so they should come from the Loire. Okay, interesting. Do we want to taste the Humo Blanco Pinot Noir, or do we want to talk about biodynamics next? Let's let's speak of biodynamics if we do Pinot Noir the, then. Okay, and one more one more note. I think it's interesting. We were talking about the fog, and then we were talking about these wines called Humo Blanco, which is a range that's named after those Humo Blanco or the white fog or the white clouds that come in. So the, the Sauvignon and the Pinot Noir underneath that brand name or, or range, Humo Blanco is actually emblematic of that uh, effect that you get from the Pacific, that cooling effect. So um, when we get to the Pinot, we'll taste that too. So um, let's move in and uh, do you want to pull Diego in and we'll uh, show a little uh, couple slides on biodynamics? Okay, go ahead. So we're going to pull Diego in from Chile, from the Lolo Valley. Hello, Diego. How are you? Hi, Lee. Bonjour, Francois. Can you hear me? Hello. Bonjour. Uh, hola, Diego. <laughs> I'm glad that, that I can join you for a little while to talk about biodynamic agriculture. Do you do you have the, the slides? Yep. I'm pulling it up now. I'm going to share some screen, and we'll pull up the... Uh, the biodynamic here. Okay, so and first of all, we need to, to establish that biodynamic agriculture, it is based on an organic agriculture. So it also doesn't use any chemical products. But here you go one step further, following three main concepts. Like I, I will try to be very schematic and simple in a quite complex concept. But uh, these are three main pillars that you need to follow in order to, to be considered as a biodynamic. So the first one is to consider the farm as a living organism or your vineyard as an autonomous living individual. This means that you, you take your, um, your, your vineyard as a closed system avoiding as much as you can any external input. So with you, when you work in those conditions, you want to have as many elements inside your vineyard as you can. That's why you can see in the pictures that we promote the, like to have like many biological corridors where you have like native plants, insects, like and some native animals that will be beneficial to our vineyard. We also introduce other actors uh, like uh, animals, farming animals, that they will develop themselves in the vineyards and they have in their life cycle something that can be useful for our purpose. For instance, you have sheep that they naturally, they, they eat grass. So they are very useful for us to control the weeds. We release them during this time, this time that is uh, autumn, they clean the whole the whole vineyard. So this is very useful for us. We have other animals like um, gooses or chickens that they eat bugs. Uh, and sometimes if you have like an insect that could be detrimental to your vineyard, they get rid of it. So this is very useful. And well, the donkey, he's great with tourists. Everybody <laughs> loves <it. laughs> Yeah, you're looking for some biodiversity there. Yeah, exactly. A holistic approach to your farm so that it runs independently. Exactly. And another concept working in a closed system is that you need to reuse or recycle all, all the byproducts. So, for instance, for us in our activity, we have all the byproducts of fermentation or the pruning materials or, or, or other residues that we can use them, we take them all together and we do compost that then we will use it to fertilize our, our vineyard. So this makes like a virtuous cycle and makes like a, a sustainable system, you know, and this is very important in this, in this way of working. The second big concept is to vivify the soil that refers to give life to the soil. Is not only to see the soil as an inert substrate where you will add 
as many nitrogen units to have as many kilos to harvest. But here, what you want is to give life to the soil, to have a healthy soil full of organic matter, microbiological activity that later on will make to have all the nutrients available for the plant. So we do that by adding the compost that we already talked about it, that is very rich in organic matter. But also there are um, eight um, biodynamic preparation that they are already established. I don't want to, 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 to enter so much into details. Each one of them, they are made from medicinal herbs and, and they have um, a good, um, sorry, I forget. Um, they, they are good to foster the microbiological activity and each one of them are related to a certain nutrient to have it available for the plant. So this is another, another thing that is very important, like healthy soil to have a good balance with the plant. Yeah, I consider the applications kind of like homeopathic. Exactly, exactly. And in yeah, this system, well, it tends to be more proactive than maybe in an industrial system where you're reactive. Exactly, exactly. You want to have healthy plants that will be resistant to stresses, to maybe like a one disease or like a, a like an idric stress. And the third, the third um, main concept is their relationship with the cosmos. And I know that this part like sounds a little bit odd and people say like, this is like horoscope. But if you think about it, it's very logic. Like think about our main star, the sun. You know that the plants, the whole life cycle of the plant is ruled by the sun. The four seasons uh, comes from the sun. The energy of the plants comes from the photosynthesis from the sun. So the influence from the sun is brutal, is enormous. And you also have the moon, our satellite. But you know that it has in our life uh, a big influence. You can see it clearly with the tides, how the, the level of the sea rises or go down according to the attraction of the, of the moon. And you know that plants are more than 90% water. So they also have this effect on the plant. You have this effect. You have the sap of the, of the plant that goes up or down. And all this can be used to, to work with it. You know, like the, the thing is like in biodynamic agriculture, you take into account this influence of the moon. And this is all summarized in this calendar where you can have which days are more um, is, is, is more useful to, to do some work in the roots or to work with the leaf or to harvest. Uh, and this is the whole concept. For instance, if you have a very vigorous plant and you want to remove the, the excess of vigor of energy that the plant has, you can do a spring pruning while the sap is up in the upper part and you will remove the, the excess or energy or if you want to to do a new planting you will try to do it when the the sap is in the roots that's the best time to do it so that's that's the main idea of biodynamic and for me you know the 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 whole concept of biodynamic of being in a closed system that where you you embrace your own condition you don't try to affect them, is this um, intensify the concept of terroir. You, you really work with those conditions. So I truly believe that our wines, you can really feel the expression of the terroir and the character of Lolol and our own identity. That's something that is very valuable, I believe. Yeah. And uh, I must I must add uh, that uh, since we have moved to biodynamic uh, techniques uh, from organic to biodynamic, uh, uh, our wines have improved uh, tremendously. 
but yeah. uh, because uh, we uh, we feed up and we work the, we feed up the vines with uh, with uh, nut natural nutrients and also we uh, so we have increased the the, the yield the and uh, the, the, uh, the the vines are more vigorous they produce better grapes and also when you stress you know uh, when you are organic simply you you can you can stress the vine by, because the vine is not protected so the, the the fruit can be stressed and you feel it in the, after that in the during the fermentation the stress and the, the wine does not express the the, the quality it should express because the the, the grapes were, uh, were were stressed so there to 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 put this uh, vines in a, such an atmosphere uh, i must say cool atmosphere uh, that uh, uh, makes the, the uh, grapes which are which are unstressed and they arrive in a, um, and they make an excellent wine much better than what we were doing before totally agree great so it's an expression of terroir and maybe you're providing the plants more natural defense against uh its enemies so to speak so that the fruit is is, is a little more pure and and expresses itself better yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. We have a question, Diego. That was tremendous. I don't think I could have ever explained biodynamics as succinctly as you just did. So thank you so much for that. We have a question yeah. before you uh, disappear here. Yeah. We have a question from Molly who asked, do the animals ever eat the grapes or the vines? Sometimes yeah. the shoots. <laughs> we try to avoid that. Uh, we already showed that during harvest, we protect the vines with these uh, nets to avoid that the the birds, especially the birds, they eat the grapes, and the other animals they try to move it elsewhere from the vine, from the vineyard during the the season of harvest. You know, the thing is like work with your with your vineyard to know when you can release the animals, when you need to keep them inside. Very good. Um, so let's, we're going to move on and taste some Umo Blanco Pinot Noir. Diego, we want to thank you for joining us here today. We look forward to being able to visit that beautiful pink uh, winery that you work in down there and maybe stay in that beautiful house that's set above on the hill and look out over the over that view and see the Umo Blanco burn off in the late morning. So uh, yeah. we can join you in person. Thank you for joining us virtually. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Cheers. So, Francois, are you ready to taste a little Pinot Noir? Yes, let's go for this uh, Pinot Noir. So, uh, always from Imo Blanco. We, this Imo Blanco uh, Pinot Noir has been our first uh, biodynamic uh, uh, registered wine uh, in the range Imo Blanco. Uh, this wine is quite a rarity because there is very few Pinot Noir uh, biodynamic in Chile. And um, and we are in Lolol, as I explained, uh, at the limit of the cold area and the warmer area. And we make a, a Pinot, and the Pinot Noir is a variety who produce quite a lot of alcohol. As we try to harvest it uh, as earlier as we can to, uh, to get it uh, ripe, but not too alcoholic and uh, the, the, to make it uh, fresh. But at the same time, myself, I am... Uh, coming from France, but I like the New World style uh, uh, Pinot Noir, a little bit rich, like you, you know, you American that, to, to produce it in California. And uh, so I've tried myself to reproduce a little bit this style of Pinot Noir. Well, it has the freshness of the variety. It has the lightness of the variety because the Pinot Noir is a variety which is a little bit light, not producing a lot of uh, tannins and color so it's not a very structured wine but it is a wine which has a, a, which is opulent at the same time eh? so it is a, it is not too tannic but it is a, it, it has a, a body and a expression in mouth and uh, so it must have this uh, little nose of uh, violet normally and uh, the, the the and express i try also there to, to go out of this uh, uh, eucalyptus expression of Chile and the, the, the Chile, Chilean coast. Uh, uh, that you can get it when you get a, a very ripe uh, Pinot Noir. And uh, the advantage of, um, of our terroir is that the Pinot Noir doesn't see the light in the morning and in the late evening. And uh, that makes a reduced day for it. And uh, it's very important uh, and uh, allowed us to have, uh, to have it quite fresh. 
even if the, the, the weather is a little bit warm for, for this variety. And uh, the, the, um, so it's, it makes a very, uh, we have a, this is a very interesting Pinot Noir. And uh, the, the, uh, I think Chile is a, in a very interesting uh, terroir for Pinot Noir. That you, you, and there is different type of Pinot Noir in Chile uh, to discover from uh, the north to the south. Uh, this is uh, one uh, 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 among the, 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 the best one. Yeah, a beautiful aromatic, as you mentioned, the kind of violet, there's a beautiful uh, perfume floral note to it and really ripe uh, red fruit. Um, not overripe, not stewed, but still that purity of Pinot Noir that we're looking for maybe from Burgundy, but maybe with the weight and intensity of California. So you're combining a little bit of the best of both worlds for me. Well, I try, I try. Uh, you know, it's uh, making a wine is a, every year a challenge. Eh? We, uh, you have uh, every vintage is different, and you have a, it's a challenge. And also, uh, this um, uh, this Pinot Noir is the first to make sugar, to to get sugar, to get the color and to get sugar in it. So it's the first to be eaten by the by the birds. It's the first to protect uh, and. Uh, and generally, it starts to, to be, uh, to be ripe, not ripe, but it starts to be a little bit uh, uh, red at, uh, during the, 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 the holiday period. So uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to have people, you know, to, uh, to be there in time to protect it. And um, the, this variety is also very fragile. It's a variety like the Sauvignon, uh, which is... Uh, very, um, very, uh, the, suffer easily of all the disease of the, 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 the vines. And, uh, it's uh, generally one of the first to catch the, the, the disease. And there, in our property, it does not suffer uh, a lot of, of the, the, this disease, thanks to this uh, biodynamic techniques that we use. Yeah, very delicate variety. Mm -hmm. Very del uh, delicate. D difficult to grow. Do we want to take a look at some more pictures of the winery and give them a virtual tour there? Yes, yes, it's such a nice place. So uh, I'm always, uh, it's always nice to, uh, to speak about it and to show it. All right, um, I'm going to pull it back up here on our screen. And uh, I'm going to take a look here. Maybe I'll take a look for some, uh, some questions here. Um, so the winery is two, is two hours south of the Santiago, the capital. And uh, it is uh, the close to a little town named uh, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, you certainly know this, uh, this name. Uh, the, you have one uh, Santa Cruz in North America also. There is several Santa Cruz. And uh, the um, Santa Cruz is quite an, uh, a, a touristic area with a small train uh, coming to it. And, uh, and there is a lot of uh, very known uh, Chilean wineries around with uh, several hotels. It's a very touristic, uh, 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 interesting place for, uh, for tourists to come. And we have uh, a lot of Americans coming uh, every year. Ah, so yeah, it's, uh, and the, 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 um, this house is, uh, is um, as I say, for rent also, if you want, but it's a place where I go to live uh, myself easily uh, to, 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 two or three times a year uh, during one month or two. Uh, the, this time I, I had I had I was in Chile when the quarantine has started in uh, in France, so I, I had to go to go back to France. But uh, normally I spend all the harvest period uh, in Chile in this house with my family, and uh, receiving uh, friends and uh, customers. The, the this uh, this place is uh, as uh, you have seen eh, the, 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 the the all these animals, all this life, uh, this wildlife. Uh, Make yeah, the, the some here, oh, some yes. of the wildlife running around. Yeah. This, uh, this goose, this uh, sheep, uh, that as Diego explained, uh, they make uh, the life uh, very uh, attractive, uh, interesting. You you live uh, with these animals in, like you were in a, an old farm, and uh, that's uh, it. It makes the place very uh, different and uh, uh, very relaxing. In a, you work there, but uh, I work there, but uh, it's quite relaxing. I am uh, always in very good mood when I am there, and uh, it's, an, uh, it's a very interesting place. The, 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 the chicken that you see there is a, is a little bit green. It's a Arocano chicken. It's a Arocan chicken. It's a, it's a, it's a especie uh, from, um, from Chile. They, uh, they are they're a little bit different. They are smaller. And uh, they can have a green, uh, green, uh, uh, plume, arrows. 
Um, speaking of work, let's take a look at the kind of the stuff you're doing in the vineyard. So you have about 30 hectares planted and all different plots here, I can see. But alors, the, every parcel has, be, has been planted uh, on different, uh, uh, with different varieties on different uh, rootstocks. Uh, because we plant, we did not plant them. Even if there is no phylloxera in the, in the, um, for the moment in Chile, we did not we did not plant uh, front de pied. We planted them on rootstocks, and um, so uh, uh, the the soil is pretty similar, pretty similar uh, everywhere. Is uh, pretty the same uh, everywhere, but uh, we have a different exposition and different, uh, and the slope can be uh, uh, harder than uh, than others. And the, um, this, uh, uh, the, we have uh, five varieties in red, which have, uh, uh, we have uh, Carmenere, uh, Syrah, and Cabernet Franc, which are the three main varieties uh, in red. And also we have a little bit uh, of Petit Verdot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and also six uh, with uh, Malbec. We have a little bit of Malbec. And um, in white, we have Sauvignon, Chardonnay, and uh, uh, a little bit of uh, Viognier that we are going, and we are planting uh, a, a French variety named uh, uh, Petit Mansin, Petit Mansin, which is coming from the, the Pyrenees on the, the, uh, to produce sweet, uh, sweet wines. And uh, uh, I have created this wine, uh, this uh, property, you know, as I, pro I create a property in Bordeaux, we have uh, made our properties in Bordeaux. It's like a chateau. You know, the, all the vineyards are, are around the winery, and uh, I have different wine, uh, different uh, varieties, which are for me uh, the, the perfect varieties for this type of terroir. And these varieties uh, produce uh, the, the wine which is unique. Unique, it is the wine of the place. It's like a chateau, uh, I don't know uh, which name. It has its own expression in his, uh, his particular wine. And there you have Claude de Lolol is a particular wine, which uh, you, nobody can make a copy of this wine or it's not uh, like uh, another varietal wine. It is a unique uh, unique wine made uh, of a blend, uh, which is my wine. So after that, you like it or you don't like it, but uh, it's my wine. Eh? Well, it I think that's it. a perfect introduction to the uh, Clos de Lolo. Um, <laughs> yeah, one the, 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 the Clos de Lolo existing in red and white. So let's ah, taste we, the red. We are losing you a little bit. Uh, we, lo we lost you a little bit, uh, Lee. Well, let's, let's taste the Clos de Lolo red. Yes, Clos de Lolo red. Which vintage is, is it, uh, Lee? Well, we probably have, I have 16, but there is 15 also in the, in the uh, market here. So we're kind of in both uh, vintages out there. So some probably have uh, 15 and some might have 16. Yes, these two vintages were quite similar. Not too hot uh, vintages, uh, 15 and 16. And uh, uh, I, uh, 15 was a, a little bit bigger producer than 16. And uh, the, the, there were very interesting uh, uh, years where we have produced very uh, easy drinking uh, wines because the tannins are very uh, ripe. And uh, it's soft. It's, uh, it's ve ve as we say in French, velouté. Velvety, it has a certain uh, velvety. Uh, sorry, uh, my English. Um. Velvety. <laughs> yeah, the, um, so we have in, uh, uh, this, uh, this wine is very uh, interesting for its complexity aromatic because uh, uh, we, we pass it in, um, in oak. So when it is young, uh, it has a little bit of this vanilla and this uh, oak tannins. But uh, after one or two years of bottles, the, the wine uh, uh, starts to express all the differences of his uh, varieties. And, uh, it's very interesting, uh, the, 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 the complexity, uh, the, the mix of aromas that we get. And uh, the Carmener has a tendency to, uh, to cover a little bit the, the others. It's a dominant variety, the, the Carmener. Eh? And the Carmener is coming uh, uh, in it. Uh, so the, the Syrah makes uh, the, the structure in mouth, the, 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 the little bit, is, is the sweetness of it. And uh, the, the, the Cabernet Franc may, uh, give it a, a certain, uh, a, a, a certain uh, tannin, a little bit serious, show it a little bit serious, uh, traditional. And the, Carme, and the Carmener make it wild make it wild, uh, bring uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, the, the, this, uh, I must say, evolution uh, type and also a little bit of this uh, mint uh, eucalyptus expression that I don't try to, to get, but uh, the, the, the Carmenere is from the, 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 the Cabernet, uh, Cabernet family and it is very green pepper expression, eh? what we call the pyrazine, the pyrazine uh, and uh, the pyrazic expression, the pyrazic expression. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to, to get a Carmenere without pyrazic expression, especially in Chile. Yeah, so every year the, the blend is meant to reflect Lolol, and it's using generally those five varieties we discussed, but the blend changes every year depending on the vintage or your, what you're trying to say with the wine. No, but, but we, we stick more or less to uh, what is uh, our production volumes, but some vintages, some varieties produce less than others, so we can uh, uh, have uh, one vat which is, doesn't work like we wanted, uh, and, uh, but uh, generally it's, uh, we can say it is uh, uh, around 30% uh, 30 uh, 30 of each of uh, the, the Cabernet Franc, Cab uh, Syrah and uh, and, um, oh, yeah. and Carmenere. Sometimes we can have more Syrah and Carmenere than, than Cabernet Franc because the Cabernet Franc is a very uh, uh, versatile uh, producer. Some years he produces a uh, tremendous volume, so other years nothing. And uh, so uh, the, the um, and uh, and after that we have uh, some uh, five percent uh, of uh, the, the, the the Cabernet Fr the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Petit Verdot, uh, with uh, can have uh, one or two percent of Malbec is uh, is nothing inside. Yeah, we have a question from uh, one of our retail friends out there, Simply Divine Oil and Wine. And it's actually where I was going to go with it in terms of tasting notes. We love to talk about some uh, some buzzwords for us, but let's see. It says, bit of it spice and then it's just right. Is there an order that you blend and ferment the varietal or are they done uh, together? Is there an order that you uh, blend? And so are you you're not co-fermenting, you're fermenting separately and then blending? Yes, we, we ferment uh, all the varieties different, uh, at different moments, except that we have uh, one parcel of, uh, of Syrah uh, that we, uh, we ferment uh, uh, with some Carmenere because they, they arrive uh, at the ripeness at the same time. The early Carmenere with the late Syrah that we ferment together. We have one vat, we go, but generally they are, they are fermented separately. I'm a true Bordelais myself. I have learned to ferment the things separately. But uh, I know that uh, sometimes it can be interesting to ferment uh, together because in, when I was in Portugal, I, was, uh, I had uh, my quinta in Portugal and I was fermenting uh, everything together. And uh, the, 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 um, is that, uh, I don't know why, the, the wine was much better because it was fermenting together and uh, there is some uh, things the, the, you cannot explain. I don't like that because I like control, but uh, sometimes there are things you cannot explain. And, uh, but they are, they are generally fermented separately. Yeah, that's actually one of my favorite stories that I love telling people about field blends and co-fermentations is what you did in Portugal where you bought a quinta fermented yeah. everything together because it was a field blend, decided that you wanted to identify each variety, separately ferment it, then blend it back together, but you could never make a wine as good as a field blend to begin with. <laughs> That's true, true. So that has been a huge experience for me and, uh, and uh, changed my life. I was uh, sure that uh, uh, things must, uh, varieties had to be separated and there I, uh, that I changed something. So, so sometimes, you, you know, people think that I travel with, uh, with my uh, roots, my recipes, but I have learned in all the places where I have been in the world. And I, today my experience is a mix of uh, what I have learned in many countries. It's not, it's, I'm not uh, doing uh, French winemaking in the places where I am. I am doing, uh, I, I, even in France, I can use a lot of, of the technic techniques that I have learned in uh, other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how many different countries have you worked in? Uh, I never had uh, made uh, an, an account of it, but uh, something like uh, 15 or uh, 18, something like that, I think uh, I haven't. And, uh, and the hmm? strangest one, Moldova? Huh? Was the, the strangest, the, most different or unique? The, the, quite, the most uh, strange condition that I have got, uh, it was in Moldova. 
in Moldova in the just after they opened the the the, the Russian uh, uh, the the Russian uh, um, system la and the communist system it has been uh, it was a uh, very strange to work with varieties that they had developed inside there because they, they had no connection with the rest of the world so they, they had uh, developed internally in Italy because they have their old their own enologists very very clever people and uh, the, the, we had created their own varieties, totally adapted to their climate. And uh, they were producing uh, wines uh, with uh, techniques uh, because they could not buy the, 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 the system uh, that we had in, in the rest of the world. Because they, so they, they, are, they are by exchange with uh, other companies of the, 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 the Russian uh, group, they had uh, succeeded in creating uh, wineries very uh, special and, uh, and to make vinification inside their, uh, these places was uh, very, uh, extremely, uh, was uh, one of my uh, uh, most uh, strange experience. <laughs> yes, necessity is the mother of invention and I bet they came up with some innovative solutions in order to try to make modern fermentations. Yes, yes, it's, um, they, are, they have been very innovative uh, and uh, this, uh, these people and uh, and uh, so, but they, 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 they were, uh, they were very tired, you know, when, when we have arrived, they were very tired by the system. They were, it was difficult to, to, to have them uh, motivated. Uh, the, 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 it was a, it was a, a strange moment, but uh, we did not stay so long. We did stay only four years there, but uh, yeah, I was with my brother at that period and it was a, a nice adventure. <laughs> That's great. Um, did you want, uh, we uh, we're taking more questions here, so if you have questions, please feel free to type in. Otherwise, um, I think we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, Francois, did you want to say hi to anybody specifically, or did you want to add anything to uh, what we might have said? Is there anything we might have missed? No, no, sincerely, uh, we have explained uh, the, the three wines we wanted to speak about. Uh, Claude de Lolo is the essential wine of the property, and uh, also the Sauvignon and the Pinot Noir that we produce are, are the, the, the perfect example of our climate. Uh, I, don't, I don't have many, many things uh, uh, more to say. I just say, uh, I hope this uh, uh, period of quarantine uh, will stop and that you could come and see us and join us uh, in the near future. Yeah, let's pull Diego in and say uh, goodbye to him and maybe raise a glass if anybody has a glass like me. Diego. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, thanks to everybody. Thanks to you guys um, for joining I us appreciate. today. Thank you. Uh, thank you for organizing that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lee. It was a pleasure. And thanks to everybody out there for watching and hopefully enjoying the wines. If you have any questions, feel free to send us uh, some follow-up. Um, this recording will be on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. So feel free to show it and share it. And we look forward to tasting with you again. We actually have another live streaming event coming up after this and every Wednesdays and Saturdays from Wine Cellar. So we appreciate you guys, your time today from the Lurton family and uh, from Chile and France. So cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Alors, you...